Okay, right, so we'll, we'll, we'll make a start now. So uh, the first speaker, we've got, uh, we've got Tati, who's come from the Data Lab in the BBC in London. And she just told me that the, the mission of the Data Lab is to glue together all of the data in the BBC. So can we all please uh, welcome Tati. questions so it seems the way expected is to have the questions after but if anyone is very curious I don't mind you raising the hand and we can answer questions in the middle as well so a bit about myself um, I'm Brazilian and I studied at the University called Unicamp it is similar to Cambridge University in Brazil um, I'm currently a senior data engineer at BBC and I'm still trying to figure out what a data engineer should do because to me, I'm just an engineer and I like to solve problems. If I can solve more problems than create, that's amazing. Um, I've worked already in education, in science, uh, building three-dimensional applications which would build three-dimensional models to help surgeons planning surgeries. Um, and I've also worked in a Brazilian media company before which had uh, high loads of user, just as BBC. Um, I use Python since 2003, um, and I'm also Amanda's mommy. So for the last one year and a few months, that's my new role. Um, Data Lab is a relative new team at BBC, and the EG is to allow the audience to reach the content regardless of which BBC branch the content had. So the audience should need to know if it is Radio 1, Radio 2, <coughs> if it is BBC 1, BBC 2, if it's sports or news. We just need to make sure if you want some content, you will be able to reach it in a personalized way. Um, and for this, we're building a machine learning platform. It's in a very initial stage. So most of what we did this far was software engineering, and let's see how far we managed to go. This is our team in London, um, and the example I'm going to illustrate, so it's based on real facts, this journey from HTTP to gRPC, and it's not very common in conferences to show mistakes. Um, and I wouldn't say our transition was a complete mistake, uh, but I would say that we could have thought better. So the purpose of this talk is to share a bit what we didn't think and what we didn't do, to try to allow others to avoid the same mistake. So um, one of our first products is a recommendation platform where we get some sort of user identifier token and then we give back news and videos targets to that user based on the user history. That's the magic. Um, in the past, we would probably build this using some monolith. Um, and as it's trendy now, uh, we're building using microservices. So this is a very simplified view of what we build, but we have a view API which will aggregate the endpoints so the uh, mobile apps don't need to do much work and can just render the information. Then we have uh, a guy who will work the street and decide which type of recommender will be used for a specific user, do some sort of A-B uh, canary things. Then we have the recommenders where the magic actually happens. We have an API in front of the database uh, which then abstracts queries and tries to isolate the technology we use underlying. So, once upon a time, in a not very far land, uh, we wanted to build this thing. So, we had this architecture and we wanted to build it. And even before the thing was built, uh, there were characteristics we should have in mind. So, microservices like us, they have personalities. So, there are computing intensive microservices which will be doing more processing, we'll need to do more mathematical things, we have more for loops and so on. Um, and they exist and we need to respect their feelings. They like to think, they like to consume CPU. That's their nature. 
And we do have another type of microservice, which is quite common. It tries to not do much, just communicate to lots of other things and assemble things together and probably go back. So it's very I.O. intensive. Some of these are usually interface and databases. Others are like a view API, which tries to aggregate things. It doesn't have much logic, but it has lots and lots of I.O. Usually the view, which receives thousands or millions of requests, will probably be very I.O. intensive. And there was a dream in the team that all the microservices would be built using the same technology. And one of the motivations for this was we had a very hybrid team, which was made of engineers and data scientists, and many of us didn't have much experience building production-ready things. So since it was already so overwhelming, we're using Google Cloud and Kubernetes and this and that, okay, let's simplify. One technology fits all. Um, and then we started building the recommendation platform. So the, the team at the time chose Flask. Flask is very simple, people could understand it, let's build it using Flask. It will look good, let's go with it. Um, and then we defined it would all the microservices would communicate through HTTP, have JSONs. Uh, we would use Swagger specs to define the JSON interfaces. We didn't reach the point where we would use the Swagger spec to validate the inputs, but we could have done that by the time. Um, however, we know since the beginning that for some tasks, uh, the Flask server would behave well, but for others, we would have some huge latency if we had concurrent users. So, this is an example of a very simple Flask server. This is a standalone code. So I tried to simulate an I.O. server. This one uses time sleep, but we could be binding on a socket or, or something else. Um, and this other is CPU intensive, which is a kind of four and some multiplication, but again, it could be doing something much, much clever, more clever. Um, so, for things which were I.O. intensive, we managed to get responses very, very fast. They would go and come back. Even Flask using Vertslag as its WSGI, it looked good. So that was okay. However, if we were using, ah, just some information, sorry, no captions. Uh, imagine the X axis is the time a request takes. So here would be the moment the request started. We have 10 concurrent requests, and all of them ended in a timely fashion order quite early. Um, you have some numbers here, and uh, just as, again, this, the I.O. intensive would sleep for two seconds, so one of the requests shouldn't take less than two seconds, and this other guy also takes almost two seconds. So if you were to make a curl request or anything, you would see they take two seconds. So with this very naive load test, which is similar to AB, you can see they took around two seconds and they were all concurrent. And so it looked fine. However, when we had CPU intensive tasks, uh, all of them would start early and all of them would end together after around 18 seconds or so. Um, and the reason for this is uh, Verxwag uses threads to, to try to... So Flask uses Verxwag by default. Verxwag is a WSGI uh, layer which uses threads. And as you are aware, um, threads in Python due to the global interpreter locker uh, don't allow us to, is, to run um, Python byte code concurrently in simultaneous threads. So what ends happening is this thread fights for CPU with all the other, and the processor says, there, okay, okay, I will try to do a bit for you, I will try to do a bit for you. And in this process, everybody gets the food late. So it takes a while for everybody to be served. Um, 
So, um, this is the explanation here. Um, and why of flask? By the standard flask would be good for intensive I.O., not that good for a CPU. Uh, so the microservices were in crisis, and then we decided to adopt Unicorn, which is a very common solution for Flask. Uh, so uh, the way Unicorn works is you have a master, and then you have workers, and then uh, the master notifies uh, when there are new requests to be processed, and the worker who's free would capture that. Um, and when you run Unicorn, you specify the number of workers. The code in the case of Flask remains unchanged, and just the way you run it changes. So here is an example with one worker, but you could set as many as you'd like in theory. But usually it's, it's recommended to set based on the CPU you have available, and for some cases this number may change. So it's good to do some empirical tests. So, uh, having one worker, unicorn worker, uh, what we could see was um, we had a single worker who would process by default synchronously. So the first request would be served, the second request would be received here, but it would actually wait the first one to be processed and then happen, and so on. And then we added two workers, so we could have a throughput of two processes at a time. And then with 10 workers, I was happy as it was initially with threads because all of them could be served concurrently. Um, now with CPU, the same pattern happened. So we had one synchronous worker, they would pile up. With three, we would have some parallel flow. And then with five, we note, okay, that's not a good number for workers in this specific case. So it's because we reached the limit and then, um, since we didn't have enough CPU resources, the workers would also fight for resources. Um, so, what we got with Unicorn was, we would be able to set a number of workers and define a fixed limit of how many concurrent processes we would have. I.O. it was okay, CPU would depend also on the CPU available. Um, the microservices were meeting their expectations at that stage, but then stronger forces heard there was this new technology, or not so new, that Google was uh, suggesting us to use gRPC, and it was amazing, built on top of protocol buffers, and we would be able to establish channels in a cheap way, uh, the serialization, we wouldn't need to serialize and deserialize, every time, um, and it would be perfect for streaming, which was not our case. And then there was this promise of higher performance, and free type checking and validation, and all these things. So, uh, most of our Unicorn Flask work microservices uh, were sentenced death uh, in order to replace by gRPC. Um, and just so you can have an idea, we had started building the Flask microservices probably around January, and then uh, this decision was made around March, and probably around July we had migrated to the things, and it was quite a significant effort for the team to share knowledge. Because imagine uh, you, uh, some of our data scientists, they were I believe they were there trying to learn all the stack and doing the deploys and then they said, okay, now I, I know how to do Flask. And then you come with an entire different thing with different concepts, stubs, this and that. So, um, we started building the gRPC generation and by the time we realized we would have a sort of hybrid protocol there, everything on TCP is still, but um, our mobile apps would still use JSON and HTTP. And then uh, internally we would mostly use uh, TCP using uh, protocol buffers 3 and using gRPC. Um, and our database would remain HTTP. So we would have a hybrid of some Flask or another framework. 
or uh, lately we found that there are some recommendations of supporting HTTP on top of gRPC, such as using Google Cloud uh, functions, um, but you would need some sort of proxy to be able to do this conversion. Um, so the way a very naive description of how it works is you define a protocol buffer, you can use the version you, which you prefer, you can specify messages, you specify services, which functions you want. This is a very naive one. Most of ours have lots of properties and things. Um, and then, uh, based on this, you generate some jerkies comment, and then the magic happens, and you get two files. One of the files uh, represents the messages. It, so it uh, does all the magic to convert to the binary and to be able to to represent the proto specification in a way we could understand, and the other are stubs to actually communicate across clients and servers, also abstracting the protocol. Uh, and something curious, although we are using protocol buffer 3, uh, the files are generated with pb2, and the reason for this is that it's the second version of the Python uh, library API used for protocol buffers inside Google because the first one was never released as open source. Uh, but since they had codes which would have both of them internally, uh, this was the path they thought it would make sense just to, to show that. Um, once you have those two magic files, you can then uh, specify the server. So this would be similar to the Flask server I showed before there would be a call which would consume some CPU, another which would use some I.O. And, and then we would have our gRPC service. And I made some very ugly code to do some sort of load test similar to the one I did. I will share after I clean it. But um, what happened with the gRPC was, when we had I.O., it was fast, similar to what we had with Flask, similar if we had 10 workers um, in the unicorn. However, if it was CPU intensive, we would have similar delays to what we had in Flask. And the reason for this is gRPC in Python is implemented using threads. So, uh, GIL is still there. And if our bottleneck is CPU, which tends to be in a recommendation platform, the problem remained exactly the same. Exactly the same. Um, so, um, we um, had this strange journey this far, where we started with Ancho Flask, we adopted Unicorn, of course, gRPC, and the path is not extremely clear. Um, the team now is willing to take this analysis more seriously since the beginning, so we don't need to convert a whole stack since the beginning, but we actually do some very tiny analysis to evaluate where the technology would be suitable. Uh, some of the things we could adopt, unicorn asynchronous workers, for instance, that's one parameter while running unicorn, and you would same code, just the call changes, if we want to use, for instance, gbench, it would allow us to have a single, here it was a single worker, processing concurrently lots of I.O. So, um, gRPC will support processes as well, so you will be able to choose between processes and threads, so that you may fit our needs. Other technologies like Tornado, or um, newer frameworks like Scenic, which is built on top of the Sync I.O., and then, the methodology changes, so you have an I.O. loop, and then you receive the events. If, you're, if there is some I.O. operation, it goes to the loop. When it's resolved, you come back, and then, in theory, you would be able to serve uncountless uh, requests in the same, with a single worker, a single process of the same. And it's very likely we will adopt this sort of methodology in some points of the stack. Um, so, I'm not sure what technology we will choose. 
I honestly don't care. Technology will change, but it's very likely we will have a, something diverse, and we will have the right technology to suit the right problems, and we will keep in mind and analyze what tends to be the bottlenecks of each of the things. Um, lessons learned. So the adoption of gRPC itself was something uh, very interesting. So there were a few good points. So this was a retrospective from the team. Um, it was good to have the specs as part of the code with the proto buffers. Um, it would support to some extent backwards compatibility. People were happy to get rid of Swagger. And it did improve some Marshley and Marshley. Um, there were a few limitations as well, such as lack of clients such as Postman. Our business analyst would love to make requests in HTTP using a nice interface. And then she was completely lost. I tried to explain gRPC Pro, which is an alternative for our other clients. But some people like these abstractions, and we don't have them because the technology is new. Um, managing stubs and messages can be confusing if you're using multiple repositories. So uh, at this point, we still have lot, each microservices in a different repo. We are willing to go to a mono repo. And while we do this, the dependency resolution and updates of the stubs when a new service is released is quite painful. Uh, it is trickier to debug. Since it's a, a binary protocol, you can't simply sniff it. TCP don't, doesn't give much meaningful, th many, many meaningful things. Um, we were not handling properly error messages, but there was our lack of knowledge on the stack. Um, and there was the analysis that Tim said, HTTP is dumb. It's simple, it does what we need. And there is the chance we will benefit from gRPC in future. If we have streaming, uh, it does have benefits. So it does keep the connection alive. And we could get lots of things with that if we use them in the right place. Um, so, and then there are lots of things we don't know, and we had chats with the Google team who builds gRPC, and they are really willing to improve and bring the community to use the technology. So, they are amazing, and I'm sure they will embrace any feedback we have. Um, so, for now, we will stick to gRPC where we can. And we will migrate parts of the stack which are bottlenecks to more suitable technologies. Um, so some of the images attributions, um, I got inspiration from a few Creative Commons things. Um, oh my gosh, let me get here. Okay, the traditional join us. Uh, so Data Lab is an amazing team. We're distributed across the UK. If there is a BBC office in your city, you would be able to join us. Um, and we've been doing lots of very interesting things and BBC is really an amazing place to work. We should be releasing an app soon, which will expose a bit of the work we've been doing. Um, and if you have any questions, thank you very much. Very much, Tati. Okay, so do we have any questions? Just one thing with it. We've only got the one microphone at the moment. So, if you have any questions, just speak up for it. And if you could maybe just repeat the question as well for the video. Okay, yes, please. Hello, uh, awesome talk. Um, really well done. Um, can you please tell me, like, when you decided, like, how did the team decide to move from microservices to gRPC? And how did you build consensus around that? Uh, um, that's a very good question. So he asked how was the decision to adopt gRPC and how was the consensus. Um, by the time the team was very new together and conflicts were somehow avoided. Which sometimes is good and sometimes is not so good. Uh, so someone was very very willing to push this technology a few people from the team brought some concerns. There was an AGR where we did consider perhaps we should do some load tests. There were some, some analysis using other programming languages. 
Uh, previous versions of protocol buffers did not perform well with Python. Uh, it's still, uh, there was this huge excitement and we just decided, okay, let's try. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, we do something else later. I think the problem is not to take the wrong decisions. We will keep making good and bad decisions. The importance is to be willing to recognize when the decision wasn't exactly the best and then try to improve things from there. So the team adopted this together and we're embracing it and we will make sure we get the best out of it. Thank you. Do we have any more? Yes, please. Um, I think you said your starting point of wanting a, 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 common, a common technology for, for all the microservices and the class on them. And another thing by what you're, you're probably going to do is something more diverse and things where it suits different components. Uh, are you concerned about losing that, um, that, that common, common core? So, um, I wouldn't say. What I noticed from the team is we have an amazing learning curve. And we've been sticking to Python. And Python is amazing. Uh, so I believe the team can adapt. And it's not a two or three web frameworks which will mess up our lives. Um, the same way the data scientists may decide to use different toolkits, different models, different things. They're just different tooling which we try and we apply in the right place. Um, so, I, I don't think, and right now, we already have Flask with Unicorn and gRPC anyway. So, um, technology we can learn, we just, and, and I, the team is very open to, to adopting and changing. Okay. Uh, what is the main reason you stayed with gRPC, although you found out that it isn't actually so superior? We had a release date, <laughs> uh, and then came a release date. So um, the we had some deadlines, and so there wasn't much we could do because there were other things to fix and other works to do. So uh, that said, uh, we will be now adapting parts of the stack to make sure we only use it where it's suitable. Um, in places where we have IO intensive tasks, gRPC doesn't work very well. Um, so um, yes, and now we will have we will have a release, and then we will have some time to breathe and, and improve a few things, and this will is likely to be one of them. Excellent. Probably got time for one more question. Any... Yes, please. Yeah. Um, did you consider using a different architecture for the recommendation part of it, instead of perhaps um, request response, perhaps a queuing methodology like Kafka or RabbitMQ? Yes. So uh, the question was if we considered a different architecture for the recommendation platform, uh, not to use uh, HTTP, but to have actually a queue and have some asynchronous processing under the hood. hood. Um, this architecture was decided before I joined the team. Uh, so I would expect there were discussions by the time. Um, we are discussing a new version a new version of the architecture which will use more asynchronous processing. And it's likely we will have a hybrid strategy. So um, this recommender is really real time. It does fetch the real time user history from the last set with precision of milliseconds, and then we can do some content-based recommendations based on this. Uh, but we are completely aware there are sorts of other recommenders and other algorithms which would be better implemented in other ways. So yes, we, we will have some cues and do some things different. Okay, well, thanks very much. So now it's, uh, time, it's uh, coffee break time now, so if we can all just like thank uh, Tati again for a second.